Come on, church, if you are able, won't you stand up to your feet? Are we ready to praise God today? Woo! I said, are we ready to praise God today? Yeah. Come on, somebody lift up a shout of praise. Hallelujah. We praise you, God.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that we serve a God all present, all powerful, everything that we need? Can we give him a hand clap? Yes. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes. Well, thank you for being here this holiday weekend with us, this Labor Day weekend. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us. We're just going to go to prayer right now for a moment. And Lord, God, we thank you that you are an ever-present help, Lord, that you inhabit the praises of your people, Lord God, and that you send your Holy Spirit here to help us, Lord God, to empower us, Lord God, to help us speak on your behalf, to give us everything that we need, Lord. And Lord, as we take rest from labor this Labor Day weekend, Lord God, we thank you that you are the one that says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Our great I am who is here now, living and breathing in each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord. Shower us, Lord God, with your presence and be with us here in this service today. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. If you're here in the house, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you for everyone that's with us online today. Um, this week, we had the pleasure on Thursday of going out as a staff and getting poured into. And so we did a little bit of vision casting for 2024. Um, we did a little bit of being in fellowship with one another, just something different than what we usually do. And one of the scriptures that we went through at this meeting was 1 John, and it's chapter, um, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and I'm going to read those to you. Um, my heading says, The Word of Life says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. We have complete joy in Jesus and all that he's doing. And so one of the things that we talked about with that scripture passage is what does it mean to you? And it means to me kind of that we're here in fellowship with one another. Jesus says he is one with the Father. He is one with us too, and we are all together in this life, doing life together, being empowered, being encouraged by one another. So that's just a great thing. I just want to give you that encouragement. And how can we come here, and how can the worship team lead you in worship if they haven't gone to the foot of the Father and they haven't worshipped him? And how can we proclaim to you the word of God if we haven't tasted and seen that the Lord is good and know that he is here, and then we can pass that on to you? So my encouragement for you is to be before him, experience him, know him. He's Jesus with skin on. He's real, and he wants to be here with us and live in and through us. Pastor Scott talked about being the salt last week. How can we be the salt if we haven't gone to the salt mill and taken from the salt maker? So just let that be an encouragement for you today as we move on with service. So before I go, I just want to tell you a couple of things. Um, we have worship night on Wednesday. Whoop, whoop, you guys excited? <laughs> excited for that. So it's going to be here um, in this room. If you want to be baptized, you have another opportunity to sign up. It's on the website and in the events where you can sign up. But do it quickly. <laughs> so we're going to have baptisms too. And then on the 10th of September, two, next Sunday, we're going to be launching our groups. So that is another way that we're in fellowship and relationship with one another by getting into one of our connect groups or one of our grow groups. But we give you these opportunities because we want to see you getting, um, getting the salt and being the salt in the world that we need to be. And then also it's first Sunday, so we're starting growth track again. We have session one. It'll be at 11 o'clock upstairs in the room right behind us um, upstairs. So if you haven't gone to growth track, we encourage you to get out there. It's where you can learn everything about us and a little bit about yourself and where your place is in the kingdom. And so that's a good thing to do too. Pastor Scott's going to come with a new series today and follow, um, finish out everything, and then he'll be with the message. So God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Good morning, everybody. One more thing I'm going to give you. The talk, Gwen was talking about opportunities. I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning to give. Amen. 
Uh, Jesus' last uh, command needs to be our first priority. You've heard that. Pastor Dan Berdur was here several weeks ago, and he talked about that. We sung about revival this morning. Lord, send it now. And uh, God, God is going to send revival, but guess who's going to do the reviving? Holy Spirit. Who does the Holy Spirit work through? Us. Amen? And so I just want us to focus for just a moment uh, on the scripture that says, where your treasure is, there's your heart. And this morning, sometimes, I'm, not, you know, I'm just saying sometimes we sing a song like, Lord, send revival, send it now. And, and do you ever find yourself, there's a gap in your life, you just kind of like, yeah, I sound, that sounds really good, yeah, go, go, but, then that's, but your heart's just not there. You know, you're just like, ah, yeah, I want that, but I'm, I've been so busy with so many other things. Well, this morning, I think Holy Spirit, what he wants us to do is want us to refocus. He wants to say that this country is a mess, this world's a mess, but you go, know good news, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And, he, and, the, and, and, and when he left, he said, I want you to go. He said, I came, now you go, all right? He's going to be with us always, wherever we go. But we've got to go, folks. We've got to go. We've got to get up and go. We've got to give. We've got to, we've got to. I had a guy years ago, and some of you have heard me say this, but I had a guy one time in a new members class, and I just asked a question. I said, so who do you think supports the church? How do you think we do all this? We've got all these buildings. We've got these people. We've got all this stuff going on. We've got this class. We've got materials. All this thing. We're, how do we do all this? And, and he said, well, obviously, he says, you must have corporate sponsorships. He says, it's got to be. He says, it's got to be Target, it's got to be Macy's, it's got to be, you know, you probably have some of the Silicon Valley guys, they probably you know, come along and they just give you, you, they give you grants. And I said, no, 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 I wish, I wish, but not really, I don't wish. But I said, do you believe it? We do it just through the people. He goes, you mean when you, we passed buckets back then. He said, you mean when you pass the bucket, you can do all of this? And I said, yeah. And he said, man, he said, that's, he was amazed by that. Amen? But it's, it's the church responsibility to support the church. So this morning, let's pray. Can you pray with me this morning? Father, give us a heart for God. Father, give us a heart for your kingdom. God, give us a heart for the things that we have, knowing that you are the owner of all things, and anything we have, God, came from you. We're simply stewards of it. You've been so generous with us, Jesus. I pray today that our heart of generosity would rise up and we'd say the first and foremost thing on my life is revival. God, send it now. God, come. This is a hurting world and the answer, we believe, is Jesus. And so God, through every method, withholding nothing, God, I give you everything that I am and I thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Can you give God a hand clap this morning? Come on. So before I get into my message, I wanted to uh, let you know that we've planned already our next trip to Israel. Um, we are going to be going March 4 to 15 in 2025. I want you to watch this real quick. Imagine yourself on a journey to Israel, walking in the footsteps of Jesus. You'll see the place where he was born, where he lived, where he taught, pray where he prayed, visit the place where he died and rose again to bring us life. Join us on our next trip to Israel, March 4th through 15th, 2025. For more information, please email israel at thehillvaleo.com. Amen. So if you're interested, you want to find out more, there are brochures available um, out in the lobby at the guest services. And if this is your first time with us today, we would love to meet you. So everybody just go to guest services after the service and pick up a brochure. We'd love to meet you. And uh, we're excited to go. One thing I want to say about the trip to Israel, um, I was asked by, uh, remember Pastor Eric came from Hillside in Napa and did the installation a few months ago, Pastor Fi, And uh, he said to me, he said, hey, our church is interested in going. Betsy and I went up to their church last week 
and we did a meeting for them and, uh, uh, to see what the interest level was to go to with us on the trip to Israel. And uh, I got to tell you, they kind of hijacked the meeting. Um, there's like 60 people that were there. So I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, if you're interested, you bet you get your registration now because we are going to have a very full trip this time, and it's awesome. So pray about it, and if you would love to come with us, we would welcome you um, uh, to join us on that journey um, to Israel. Today we start a brand new, everybody say brand new, brand new series, um, and it's called He Is. The idea behind this series He is, is that we're going to take a look at who Jesus says he is based on one verse. Next four weeks, one verse. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because we want to know who does Jesus say he is. The verse is uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, and this is what it says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Who is Jesus? This morning we're breaking it down, part one, Jesus is the great I am. We're looking at I am. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am. And when Jesus said that, it's interesting because he is identifying himself with God. And so this, this idea, of this message today, and we're talking about the I am, we, we need to understand that, that what this sermon's about, what this message is about, and, and really what today is about is identity. It's about identity. Who did Jesus identify as? And isn't that relevant? Doesn't that seem so relevant in this day and age? Because everybody is searching for their identity. We all want to know who we are. And I'm going to tell you that I believe, and I'm going to show you this morning, that Jesus, he, he needed to know who he was, just like you need to know who you are. And because he knew who he is, I can know who I am. Because I'm part of the great I am. Oh man, there's a lot to unpack here today in just these two words. Jesus said, I am. And when he went through some difficult things, and you go through some difficult things, guess what? It's what, who you identify with and who you identify as a person that's going to get you through. So we better have our identity straight today. And that, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great discussion today. Everybody, everybody wants to know their, their identity. And, and, and uh, you know, we all are, are, are faced with this idea that sexual identity. I mean, kids in school now are having to choose their pronouns. Who do you, who do you, who do you say you are? Or who are you? And sexual identity is a big deal. There's um, cultural identity. You know, we, we want to know our history. We want to know culture. We want to identify with, with who we are. Um, I mean, you can go to the political realm. And, and, and the reason I say all these things, I'm kind of over, going over them quickly, but, but let's face it, we, we all who are, how many believers in Jesus this morning? Come on, born again, spirit-filled, come on, don't be, don't be shy, be loud, be proud, come on. That is our true identity, right? But how many of us, even as believers, have lost our identity? It's to a degree. We've lost our identity in politics. We've lost our identity in culture. And some of us even have lost our identity in sports. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm an A's fan, man. And I'm telling you, it is so difficult to identify as an A's fan. It's tough. But I identify as an Oakland A's fan. Somebody say, we're praying for you, brother. We're praying for you. You're going to need our prayer. But today as we look at Jesus' identity and ours, I want us to answer the question after we hear these scriptures and after I put forth, I want you to be able to answer the question, and this is the question, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Because that's that you, you got to have that settled. Who do you think? Who do I say I am? And Jesus had had to answer that question, and his question was answered in John fourteen six. He says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." And so maybe all of us know this, but just maybe somebody doesn't know this. When Jesus said, "I am," that is a that is a significant 
statement right there. You say, well, you just said, I am. Okay, I am. I always say, I am. I'm an A's fan. I am. But I am was a title. And let's go back to Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, I put up on the screen, this is what Jesus was referring to. And this was a big deal. Jesus said that I am in, in um, Exodus chapter 3, verse 11 to 15. When Moses was talking to God, God was appearing in the burning bush. And Moses asked the question, he says, well, who do I, who do I tell Pharaoh is sending me to bleed the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said, supposes, uh, supposes, Moses said, supposes. <laughs> Moses said, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what's his name? What shall I tell you? Which I tell them, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In verse 15, it says, you can attach uh, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh is also Lord. A name so holy that there are some Orthodox Jews that feel like their mouth is not, is not worthy enough. They're not holy enough to even utter that name. So they substitute for Yahweh, Hashem or Adonai. God was present with Moses. And he said, this is who I'm sending. I'm sending, I'm sending you. I'm present with you. So be, I am means I am present with you. The Lord is present with you. Jesus, in John 14, 6, says, I am. He is identifying himself as God. No wonder the Pharisees and other religious leaders went berserk when they heard that, because they knew, they knew the weight of this statement. But we read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says that, For in Christ all the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in bodily form. Just as God said, I will be with you, Moses. Jesus came, Philippians tells us, enveloped in the flesh. So that as we say at Christmas time when we quote from Isaiah, his name shall be called Emmanuel, for he is God with us. Jesus said in John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In John 10, 30, 10, 30, he said, I and the Father are one. And I could go on and on. In, John, in the book of John, if you look, Jesus makes seven I am statements. This is not something that he just tossed out once. This was a theme. He identified himself as God in the flesh. The fullness of the deity dwelt in bodily form. In Jesus, the I am. So in John, there's seven I am statements. You'll hear them throughout this month. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. There is no doubt who Jesus was identifying himself as. He is God in the flesh. And suffice it to say that Jesus knew who he is and what his purpose was. So I submit to you this morning that knowing his identity helped him be able to get through some of the 
most challenging situations and the most difficult circumstances that he faced. And I want to encourage you this morning that in the same way, if you will find your identity in Christ, it is your identity in Christ that is going to get, through, get you through your situation. It's going to get you through your circumstance. You need to know who you are. So Jesus had some challenging, he said, I'm, I am, I am, I am. But he had, some, he had some challenge to that statement. Not everybody agreed with it. Not the least of which was the devil. You remember after he was baptized, he went out and spent 40 days fasting. And then he went into in the wilderness and, and was tempted by the devil. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, it says, during the season of temptation... One of the things, there were three temptations, but one of them I'm going to focus on this morning was that the devil took him out to the pinnacle of the temple and he said, if you are the son of God. So apparently the devil had been paying attention to who Jesus was saying he identified as. Because he came out and he said, he didn't say, uh, you know, you're the, you're the cell phone salesman. You know, you're not the car salesman. So yeah. If you say you are the son of God... Then from the pinnacle of the temple, throw yourself down because the Bible, the, the scripture says that he will send his angels to guard you lest you strike your foot against a stone and they'll pick you up. Jesus' response, Jesus' response was from Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. He said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And I don't think he was just saying in general terms, oh, devil, don't put the... He, was, he knew the devil was saying, okay, you claim to be God. And D Jesus answered in the, same, in the same vernacular and said, well, then don't put, your, don't put God to the test. It was his identification as a son of God that helped him fight these battles. There are other difficult situations. For instance, in John chapter 12... Verses 27 and 28, Jesus is contemplating coming to the time where he, he's going to be uh, crucified. And he said, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour? No. For it is this very reason that I have come to this hour. For Jesus knew that he was here to give his life as a ransom for the world. That the only one that could that could ransom the world back to God, that could reclaim, that could redeem, there had to be a sacrifice that was sufficient. And God, they had worked it out. And he said, You're gonna, Jesus said, I will go. He will go and I will die in their place. Jesus, though in his flesh, he was troubled. We get troubled in our flesh. Yet because he knew who he was, he was saying, No, I, I'm not going to allow my heart to be troubled. How many of us allow our hearts to be troubled? We get overwhelmed with our circumstances. The reason we do is because we're not listening to the voice of God, to the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I'm the one that's speaking to you. We get ourselves all overwhelmed. We get ourselves worked up. But Jesus, he, he got a little trouble there but for a moment, but then he realized who he was. And he said, no, this is the purpose for what I come for. And that's the thing. I'm going to come back to this, but I really think unless you, don't, unless you know what your who you are, you won't know what your purpose is. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Other examples. When the Pharisees opposed him. Or when the people of his home, hometown rejected him. They said, they said you know, he gets up and he reads a scroll from Isaiah. And he says, this, this uh, you know, I've come. Uh, he, he reads from Isaiah where it says that, you know, bring... Uh, good news to the poor and preach liberty to the captive. And today this has been, you know, in other words, the Messiah, when he comes, is going to do all this stuff. And today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's who I am. It's been fulfilled in your hearing. And it says, Betsy and I were just reading this this week, and it was like they marveled at his teaching. They marveled at his word. But when he said that, all of a sudden they just went, wait a minute. This is in Nazareth, his home, hometown. Wait a minute. Isn't this the carpenter's son? See, they identified him only in the flesh. But Jesus stood up and said, no, that's not who I am. I'm identifying as the son of God. And you know what they tried to do? They tried to kill him. 
They tried to kill him. They just couldn't buy into that concept. Another example, when, when uh, Lazarus got sick, Jesus was delayed. You remember that story? When Lazarus got sick, Jesus delayed in coming, and Lazarus died. And when Jesus came, Mary was mad. And I guess she had a right to be. She was in you know, grief, anger, part of grieving. And she said, Lord, if you'd have been here, this never would have happened. And what was Jesus' response? Oh, Mary, I'm so sorry, you know, I was busy and people were needing me and I just got delayed. And No, it was, his delay was deliberate. Because he knew that God was going to glorify himself through this situation. I don't know about you, but you've got to be pretty secure. You've got to be pretty secure in who you are to just kind of let that stuff go. Because I'm not that, I don't know that I'm that kind of person. I'm like, I'm going to run the hospital and see him before he dies. Because <laughs> I, I don't want her wrath coming down on me. Come on, somebody. But Jesus is like, no, it's all going to work out. It's going to be fine. And what was his response? Come on with me this morning. What was his response? He said to Mary, I am the resurrection. I am, I am. His response to a difficult situation was who he was. This response to a difficult situation in our lives needs to come from who we are. Because that's the model that Jesus gave to us. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And so who... Who do we identify with? Because Jesus is the great I am, I can know who I am. Jesus not only offers us a new identity, but he offers us life. He gives us a new, he gives us a new life. He didn't come just to make your old life better. He came to give you a new life. In John 15, 5, he says, I am, another I am, I am, God is the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. In other words, you will achieve your God-ordained purpose. But apart from me, you can do nothing. But in me, ask whatever you will. And that just kind of blows my mind. I don't have time to unpack that this morning. But he said it, so i got to believe it. He said, ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. But only if you find yourself in the, in, the, in the vine. So many people today are frustrated. And their lives are empty. They're frustrated. Why? Because they haven't become part of the vine. Because they haven't yet identified with Christ. They don't have the new life. So out of, and we're going to look at Ephesians in just a moment. So out of their, their, out of their dead. He says before we come to Christ, we're dead. So out of our deadness and our trespasses of sin, we're trying to create a new life. It just doesn't work. No wonder people are so very frustrated. In fact, I just want to, I just want to go, I want to go to Ephesians uh, 2, and then we're going to come back to 1 John chapter 5. So let's put Ephesians, because this is really what I want you to see this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to be reading uh, verses 4 through 9. Here it is. It says, but because of his great love for us. Do you realize God is for you? Everybody say, God's for me. God is for you. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. In other words, before we knew him, before we were even born, Jesus came and he died. Died for the whole world. Doesn't have to come and die again and say, oh, I didn't cover you, didn't cover you. Covered everybody. Everybody that was born will be born. Jesus' uh, sacrifice was sufficient. But he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, and is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up. Check this out. God raised us up with Christ, And has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, that no one can boast. When you come to Christ, you not only become part of the vine, but God gives you a brand new life, and he makes you, though you are still, though still you are uh, citizens of this earth, you are also citizens of heaven already. That when you receive Christ as Lord and Savior and you're born again, you get dual citizenship. And too many of us are trapped in this idea that I, I, I'm saved, but I won't be saved until I'm dead. No, you were dead, you got saved, now you're alive. And, and though your feet are planted on terra firma, your, your, your personality, your soul, your spirit is united with Christ in heaven. You are seated with him. You are with him. And he has deposited the Holy Spirit in you, and the Holy Spirit is a deposit on what you're going to get paid in full when you do get there. But the point of it being is that too many of us, listen to this, too many of us spend our time reacting to things that are happening to us on earth and we're looking up toward heaven and we're saying, oh God, the devil, oh God, this is happening, oh God, you gotta do this. When in fact Jesus did not react from, heaven, from earth's perspective to what the devil was doing, he was looking down from heaven. He says, I only do and say what I see and hear the Father doing in heaven. You are seated in heavenly places. You have access to the Father. So instead of looking up, we need to be getting a, a, a bird's eye view. Of what, what is heaven's view of what I'm going through right now? We respond, not react. So you got to do that. You, you've really got to make a change. And your identity has to come from heaven. You're seated in heavenly. Put your mind, get it off of earthly things. Set your mind on heavenly things. Because God is limitless. And so here's the thing. Everybody, everybody's looking for their purpose. Everybody's looking for their identity. Who am I? Who am I? What's my gender? What am I, you know, who, who, what is my purpose? Who am I? Who, what? And the whole idea is people it, without Christ are trying to find that through their, through their dead life. They're not alive. How can you find life when you're dead? It, it just it does, doesn't make sense. All of a sudden, you're like, boom, I, didn't, I never thought about it that way. But all the talk and all the stuff, it's just, it's just, it's, it's just coming from death. It's, it, there's no life in any of that. There's life in Jesus' name. So we sung this morning, we need revival. And so instead of wagging our finger at people and saying, well, you know, that's not right. And the Bible doesn't say that. And, you know, we're upset with the world, the way they're behaving. Well, they're dead. They're dead man walking. But they're looking for the same thing that we all are looking for. Life. You see, if I can only get this, I'll be alive. No, that didn't work. So they go to the next thing. And we can see generation after generation after generation. The generation always has the thing. This, if we can just do this thing, then we're going to, yeah, then we're going to find it. Well, whatever it is, I don't know. But I think it is life. And you're not going to find life until you find it in Jesus. And identify with him. That's the answer. And so we, you know, again, here we go. We, back to last week when we were talking about, well, you know, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, that you might be, have an answer for all who, who ask. And we, we get wrapped up and people want to know, well, there's a, the Bible doesn't say anything about this, and so well, the Bible says about this, but wait, 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 time out. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Because we got to start. Because I, I, any conversation that I have with you about all the, it's just coming out, you're, you, you know, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. I, it's just, you're just dead. I can't, I, can't bring, I can't bring life out of that, but I can, I can bring you to the life. The one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I can bring you to him. And if you'll begin that, re that 
relationship with him. What does it say? It says if, if, you're, if, if you're part, if you're a branch, you're in the vine, that's where you're going to find life. You've got to get connected. Revival is getting people connected to God. So that's our conversation. And we, we can't be afraid. We got to know who we are. You got to know who you are. Okay, so let me go on and go back to 1 John 5, 12. And this is what it says. This is the testimony that God has given us. Eternal life. This life is in his son. Whoever has this son has life. In John 14, 20, it says, On that day you will realize that I am in the Father and that you are in me and that I am in you. When God appeared to Moses, he said, I will be with you, Moses. When Jesus came in the flesh, he said, I'm Emmanuel, I am God with you. But when Jesus ascended, he said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And he said, he will be with you, but he will also be in you. So we have the most intimate connection with I am that we will have until we see him face to face in heaven. Jesus said, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and I am in you. And so here's the comforting thing about this. Graham Cook said this. He said, when you're in Christ, you never have to wonder if you're lost. Because you're in Christ. Think about that for just a moment. You're going through something, and you say, God, I feel like I'm really lost right now. No, you're not. You're going through something, but you're not lost. You're in Christ. See? No, you're not. You're seated in heavenly places. You just need to set your mind where, you're, <laughs> where your seat is. <laughs> oh, I just thought of something, but I better not say it, right? But you're thinking it. Get your rear end over here. All right. Be where you're seated. Let your mind be where you are seated. Amen? You're never alone. God, I feel so, I'm so alone. No, you're in Christ. And Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. What did he say now? Come on, finish it out. I am with you, even until the end of the age. Come on, somebody. God said, I am with you. Oh, God, I feel so alone. No, you're not alone. You're in Christ. And yeah, you, you, I understand we all need companionship. We need fellowship. We've got all that. But there's some times when we, just, we can be in a crowd and still feel alone. God, I feel so alone. No, you're not alone because you're in Christ. I'm lost. No, you're not. You're in Christ. I am with you wherever you go. Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses. It says, I'm in Christ, and the life that I now live by faith in the Son of God, the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So you have to answer the question, who am I? Oh, I'm a child of God. Who am I? I'm an heir. I'm an heir. I'm a son. I'm a child. I'm in Christ. I'm a new creation. So this morning, answer the question, who do you think you are? Just who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And it makes all the difference. I want you to stand with me this morning, would you? We're going to receive communion in just a moment, but I want to sing a song. I asked the, the team to prepare this for us this morning because I want to, we answer the question, who do you think you are? We're going to sing the song, I am who you say I am. Let's sing it together.
Hallelujah. Yeah, put your hands together. Awesome. So this morning as we receive the emblems of communion, if you need the cup and bread, would you just raise up your hand and our hosts are coming by. They're going to give it to you so you can partake with us. Just leave your hand up and they're going to bring it to you. Thank you. Thank you. But because of Jesus being who he was and who he is, I can know who I am. I'm chosen. I'm not forsaken. I am loved. I'm a son of God, a daughter of the Most High King. That's who you are. But this morning, I have to ask the question, until you have made that decision to receive what Jesus has done, I read it, There's nothing that you work at or that you try to earn or think you deserve. It comes as a gift. And unless you've received that gift, you're still dead in your trespasses and sin. You haven't realized who you really are and your full identity in God and be able to understand what it is to have this dual citizenship. Yeah, I'm here on earth, but I can have a relationship with God now that's going to last forever, for eternity. But it's very simple. You simply respond to Jesus by saying, yes, I received that. Thank you. It's just a heart of gratitude. When someone gives you a gift, you don't try to say how you deserved it or because of anything that you've done. You just simply say, thank you. And when you've received the greatest gift of all, all God wants to know is that you know. 
He just wants you to know that you know that you know who you are and who He is. And because you know who He is, you can know who you are. So let's pray this morning. God, we thank you for the covenant, the covenant that came to us, that we could belong to you, that you bought us back, you redeemed our life from the pit, from hell and the grave, and you've given us life, and you've set not only our feet upon a rock, but you have set us also in, in another realm of heavenly places where we, we don't have to be under our circumstances anymore but we can be overcomers because we're in Christ. And Christ is victorious over everything. And you've told us we can do all things in and through you. It's all because of this covenant. And so we want to pause this morning. We want to honor you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. We want to particularly remember and, and pause to know that you had a choice. And in the garden when you prayed... Take this cup from me if there's another way that in your flesh you were tempted in every way as we are, but because you knew you were I am, you were able to say, I am able to do this. So I am able to submit myself to your will, Father, not my will, but your will be done. So we honor you, Jesus. Thank you for that. And thank you for offering us life. And for no other reason, because of your great love for us. We bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, let's take the bread together. And then we'll take the cup, which represents the blood that Jesus shed on our behalf. Let's take the cup. sing that again. I am chosen, not forsaken. Come on, let's sing it one more time. Declare who you are. hands together and give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. 
So earlier in the service, you heard that this Wednesday night we're going to be offering service of baptism along with praise and worship. And maybe this morning you've, you've come to the, to the knowledge of who you are in Christ. You never knew that before. You received Christ this morning. God's Spirit is in you. And, 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 and the follow-up to that is to identify with Him publicly. And you can do that even this Wednesday. Look at the timing. Look at God. Just You don't have to wait. You can come Wednesday night, actually Tuesday night, come for the orientation, answer your questions. But Wednesday night, come and go public with that faith. And perhaps there's others that, you know, you, you've been saved for a long time, but you never went public with your faith. But today you said, I know who I am. And I, I'm ready to go public with who I am. And yes, it's about telling others, but sometimes we need, to, we need to show ourselves that we need business. Come on, somebody. You know, sometimes we just need to, the one that's hardest to convince is this one right here. So you need to take that flesh by the nap of the neck and say, come on, flesh, you're going to get wet. Because in here, we're different. And we need to make that public. Amen? So, Father, thank you for this day. God, thank you. We give you praise and worship for who you are because of who you are I'm a child of God we bless you today Father help us today the circumstances the things that we face that we would we would know that we are overcomers in Christ and that we're in you you're in us and that makes all the difference because we have life in Jesus name everybody said amen Amen, amen. All right, God bless you guys. If you would like prayer, come on down here. We'd love to pray with you this morning before you go. Otherwise, have a blessed day. We'll see you on Wednesday night.